Reading will be from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. We're reading from the New American Standard. And when he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in the spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all things of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, when I get up here and speak, um, I'm not always allowed to come up and speak on whatever I'd like to talk about. There are times where Brent asks me to speak on a certain subject, and tonight he asked me to speak on Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, um, which I'm, I don't feel properly equipped to do, but I'll try to do as best as I can, because this is a, this is a tough nut to crack. It doesn't always make sense the way Jesus says the things he says. You know, based on our understanding, we look at those who mourn and we don't automatically come to the conclusion that they're blessed. We look at those who are persecuted and we don't come to the conclusion that they're blessed. And so the way we, we actually can look at this and better understand it is by understanding who and what is blessing them and why this is happening in the first place. And so in order to understand that, we have to understand Jesus' worldview, his perspective of the nature of reality. And tonight, I'm going to be talking about some, some abstract notions, but I'd like you to follow along because I think you'll see that they're actually very relevant to our daily lives. These are very practical, actually, and they're not just abstract for the sake of abstract. So we need to understand Jesus' worldview. And a worldview is a set of beliefs and ideologies that sort of make up a lens and it's through this lens that we interpret our surroundings and the world around us. So for example, naturalism is a worldview. Naturalism says that the world around us is only made up of the things that we can see and taste and smell, the things we interpret through our senses, and there is no such thing as God or a soul or a spirit. There is nothing beyond what we can sense. This is naturalism. And so in this worldview, the world often seems chaotic. It seems random when we try to understand our surroundings based on this worldview. And this worldview is probably one of the most popular that we have today. People aren't making decisions in court based on a worldview that's polytheistic. They're not making decisions based on that. They're making decisions based on a naturalistic worldview. And polytheism is a worldview. Polytheism says that there are multiple gods, and there are gods in the water and in the air and in fire, and each god kind of has its own domain. And so this is a set of beliefs and ideologies that create a lens, and through this lens, people interpret the world around them. Now, Jesus has a worldview, and Jesus' worldview is that all of reality is based on God and the kingdom of God. And everything comes under this umbrella. All of human history is rushing toward God and the kingdom of God. That there will be a final judgment. The kingdom will be fully revealed. We will be in the presence of God and God has created everything. 
God and the kingdom of God is the lens through which Jesus is saying, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And so the Christian worldview is is probably the most likely explanation of the way we experience reality. That's why I'm a Christian. To me, it, it, it explains the human heart, why, why people are evil, that people aren't necessarily good. People have bad intentions. It explains the human condition, that things aren't random, but there's a design, and that people are a part of this design. And so the Beatitudes only make sense when we look at them through Jesus' worldview. That all of reality comes from God and the kingdom of God. And everything is heading toward this. And so if you're, if you're following along in your bulletins, I've made some adjustments. We will not be going over uh, point two. The first point and the, the major third point is really what we're going to be focusing on this evening. And this is what uh, I think will ultimately lead us to a better conclusion. I think it's better to expand on these two points than to go over point two. And I know that it may seem like we're, we're not going in a direction, but I assure you we are. I'm going to be building these blocks, and at the end it will make sense. And you will see that this is totally and completely practical for our daily lives. And also, I only have one slide and we're going to go over it at, toward the end of the lesson. So don't, don't think that I'm not going over my slides. So the first point that we're going to be looking at is the kingdom. And the kingdom of God and how our reality comes from God and the kingdom of God. And so we see that this is really the explanation for all of reality. This is the reason people were created in the first place. People were created... To, to have a relationship with their creator in the place where their creator is. This is why we were created. Romans 8, in a sense, talks about all things are working out for the good of God and those who love God. So when we look at the world, we see that all things are working toward the good of God and the good of his kingdom. Everything. Everything. This is, you want to look at Hollywood? Do you want to know why Hollywood is making the movies that they're making? Because all things are working out for the good and the glory of God and his kingdom in ways that we can't always understand. You know why people were killed in the flood and only no one in his family was saved? Because all things are working for the good and the glory of God and his kingdom and the people who will be allowed into this kingdom. This is the worldview of Jesus. That all things, all of human history is rushing toward the good and the glory of God and his kingdom. And the entrance that people have into this kingdom. That's what it's all building toward. And so this is the reason for people, why they were created. And this is also human nature. You know what human nature is? Human nature is, is a touchy subject. Because many people today want to say that humans don't have a nature. I've, I read a book by Jean-Paul Sartre, who's considered one of the, the most intelligent men who have ever lived. And in this book, he says there is no such thing as human nature. And in order to understand this, you have to understand nature describes our limits. So, for example, a book has a nature. A book is used, you read from it. You can't use a book for deodorant. That is outside of its nature. You can't use a book to, to, as a boat to swim to Hawaii. It is outside of its nature. And so people also have a nature. People were created and designed in a certain way. And when we go against our nature, we run into reality. In order to prepare for this subject, I was doing a lot of reading uh, by Dallas Willard. And Dallas Willard says, Re when you run into reality, reality is... When you have a car that has no gas in it, and you keep telling yourself that there's gas in it, and you try to drive, what will happen? You will run into reality, whether you want to or not. And so that's what the Bible does. The Bible helps us understand human nature. Because under the Old Testament, uh, there were laws such as, if you found mold in your home, you were to clean it and your home was unclean, 
And then if the mold reappeared, your home was, was continually unclean and you were to destroy it. Because it is against human nature to be in a home that has mold in it. What happens? We get sick. We can't live in a home like this. It's against our nature. And if we live in a home like this, we will run into reality. Or for example, uh, intimate physical contact between two people. This is, according to the Bible, only to be done in marriage. And when it's not done in marriage, when people have multiple partners, or they have these kind of relations with people of the same gender or even with animals, what happens? People get sick. They get diseases. They run into reality because it is against our nature to not to have these kind of relations outside of marriage. And whether we like it or not, human beings have a nature. And so the kingdom of God, God and the kingdom of God and all of reality heading toward this is what human nature is all about. This was how we are designed. This is why Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because Jesus was a kingdom preacher. That's what he preached about, was the kingdom. We're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else we need will be added to us. If we, if we hone our perspective to zeroing in on God and his kingdom and heading toward this, and so as Christians, you know, our evangelism, our evangelism or our ministry, because Brent and I aren't the only ministers, you know, all of Christians are really ministers, you, you minister to the world. Our ministry should be focused on the kingdom. Jesus was a kingdom preacher, and we need to teach people about the kingdom. And I feel like this is one of those subjects that's extremely important, but is not always talked about. That, that everything has to do with God and his kingdom, and we need to put this first. We need to be kingdom preachers. That the kingdom of God is available to everyone who would seek God with all their hearts. And when people don't seek God, when people ignore God, and they say there is no such thing as human nature, I want to indulge in my own desires... When they die and they meet God, they will run into reality because they have gone against their nature. So Jesus was a kingdom preacher. We need to understand this, that all of reality has to do with God and the kingdom of God. And Jesus preached the kingdom to people. This was so much of his ministry. John the Baptist said, you know, repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. And then Jesus said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he said, the kingdom of God is like this. It's like a mustard seed. He taught people about the kingdom. And when they say at hand, it doesn't mean like it's 10 years down the road and it'll come eventually. It means spatially it is close to you. And we understand there's been like a, a partial revealing of the kingdom that we can step into so that when the kingdom of God is fully revealed, we are already a part of it. The kingdom of God is, is an amazing thing. It's an assurance of our salvation. And so Jesus was a kingdom preacher because this was his worldview. That God in the kingdom of God explains reality. And this is what we see in the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes start with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 12 it says, Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. All through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is preaching about the kingdom of God. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he ends with, you know, there will be those who enter the kingdom of God and those who don't. And those who listen to Jesus are like wise men who built their house on the rock. And those who don't listen to Jesus are like foolish men who built their house on the sand. Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount and ends it with the kingdom of God. This is his teaching. This is his preaching. He's a kingdom preacher. And so this has everything to do with the gospel. The gospel is built on God and the kingdom of God. I once, a few months ago, gave a lesson on the gospel. And I tried very succinctly to sum it up. And I had told you that um, the gospel is a message from God, that your relationship to God 
has been restored by God. I know there's some truth in this, but this is also very limited because it says nothing about the kingdom. If our relationship to God is restored, but we're not allowed to be where God is, why would we follow him? What hope would we have? Who would listen to Jesus if Jesus said, your relationship to God has been restored, but when you die, you have no hope of being where God is. That the gospel is built and its foundation is on God and the kingdom of God and our relationship with God. It's all of these things. And so, so much of what Jesus taught has to do with a worldview where the kingdom of God is the explanation of reality and why we experience the world as we do. So if you're following along in your outlines, we are now going to skip point two and go straight to point three, where I ask the question, what's so special about the kingdom of heaven? What, what's the big deal? Why is this so great? And I think we can actually answer this uh, by looking at the Trinity, that the Trinity can actually help us to understand how amazing the kingdom of God actually is. And so this is my one slide. I wanted to, I mean, obviously you can't represent God in two dimensions, but you got to, one of the, the best uh, representations of the Trinity is a triangle. Because you, can, you can't take a corner out of the triangle and it still be a triangle. God has to be complete with these things. So when we talk about God, we have to remember we are not only talking about God the Father. We are talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's God. God is three persons and one Godhead. And this isn't a contradiction of nature. It's not a contradiction of Scripture. It, in fact, better helps us to understand love and how this is logically possible. So first of all, it's not a contradiction of nature. We see this in nature all the time. A tree is made up of many branches. There are many things but one tree. A t-shirt has multiple threads, but it's one t-shirt. It's many, but it's one. We see this all around us all the time. It's not a contradiction in Scripture either. In fact, it's a better understanding of the Old Testament. When God said to Israel, Hear, O Israel, your, the Lord your God is one, the Hebrew word there is not one in number, but one in unity. It's the exact same word that's used when God says a man and a woman will join together and become one flesh. It's multiple, but it's one in unity. It's the exact same word that's used when, when Joseph is interpreting Pharaoh's dreams and Pharaoh has multiple dreams. You know, it's the dreams of the cow and the corn that's predicting this coming famine. And Joseph tells uh, Pharaoh, your dreams are one and the same. He had multiple dreams, but they were one. And this helps us better understand why God would say something like, let us make man in our own image. The Trinity is a further explanation and a better understanding of even the Old Testament. So it's not a contradiction of nature. It's not a contradiction of scripture. And in fact, helps us better to understand love. Because you can't have love with just one person. So this is actually the problem that Muslims and Jews have. When they say God is only one God, well, then you have to say, well, if God is what we say immutable, meaning he doesn't ever change, God does not change, and he's only one, then where did he learn how to love? The Trinity actually explains this. That love can exist because there are Three persons in one God. Love is existing between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so let's put this into the context of the Beatitudes. In God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, what we have is is an, an, an eternal community of love within God themselves like an eternal community of God of love excuse me this this doesn't exist anywhere you know if 
If someone joins like the stonemasons, be like, oh, the stonemasons have been around forever. I feel privileged to be a part of this. Have the stonemasons been around since before the earth was created? There is a community of love that has been around since before the foundation of the world. That where, where God now has this community of love and he comes into the kingdom of God. His very presence is there and he expands it. And he allows you into it. Don't you see how amazing this is? That we're allowed into this? That's unbelievable. Now can you see why there are scriptures that say things like, you can't get to heaven based on your own righteousness, based on your own works? Who could ever work hard enough to be qualified to be a part of this? To be a part of this community that has been around since eternity? How could we be anything but humble and thankful To be a part of this. And this is what Jesus has in mind when he's going through the Beatitudes. This is why Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see how even if you're poor in spirit, you're blessed because you get to be a part of this. And it's not fact, it's not like, it's not fictional. And it's not like a hope that might happen. It is a fact of reality that there is God in the kingdom of God. And all of eternity is rushing together to bring human beings into a community of love that has been around since eternity. That all of human activity and our social works and everything that goes on around us is ultimately building up for the good and the glory of God and his kingdom. And we're a part of this, whether we want to be or not. We're here and we must decide to go with our nature and be a part of this or to deny that humans have nature in the first place and to indulge in selfishness and our own desires. This is why people are blessed. This is why someone can mourn and be even blessed. It's not a bad thing to mourn. It's, there's nothing wrong with mourning. Even Jesus wept. But can't you see how even when someone mourns and when we're sad in our daily lives, when something goes wrong, we can remember how blessed we are by being able to enter into this community of love between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, into his very presence, and be filled with his love. This is incredibly practical. That your daily life, the way we go about our routines, when we're raising our family, when we go to our jobs, all of what we experience it isn't what people say on the television. All of what we experience is building toward the good and the glory of God in his kingdom. And we get to be a part of this. This is why we're blessed. This is why those who mourn are blessed. This is why even those who are persecuted are blessed. Because they get to be a part of this too. None of us are worthy to be a part of this. None of us have done anything to earn this. Who could ever earn this? But we're allowed to be a part of it. We're allowed to step into the community of love that God has had between themselves for all eternity. And because of this, we're blessed. This is the worldview Jesus has in mind when he's saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. That all of reality is built on God and his kingdom and the human's entrance into this. This is how blessed we are. So this is the, this is the lesson. This is just how blessed we are. We got to remember Jesus was a kingdom preacher. He taught this. And sometimes I think we get wrapped up in in all the little details that we sometimes forget the big picture stuff. And this is big picture stuff. This is the reason why we're Christians, that we can enter into something that is so, so holy and so glorious and so grand in, in indescribable ways. And we're blessed because of this. And this is the kingdom that Jesus preached. 
So if you have not entered into this kingdom, or if you need help seeing why this is the explanation for the world around you, if you want to see why the kingdom makes the most sense in how you go about your daily lives, or if there's anything at all that we can do to teach you, to help you, to pray for you, or to comfort you in any way, we'd ask that you come forward now while we stand and sing the invitation song. All things are ready.